I'm Chandra Muzaffar from Malaysia. I head a public interest NGO called uh, the International Movement for a Just World, which has been involved in dialogues of civilization for quite a long while. We have uh, focused upon dialogues with uh, various religious communities and we have also looked at a dialogue within the context of uh, power relations which I think is very important. In order to understand dialogue, both its strengths and its failures, one has to look at uh, power relations. I'm also involved with the World Public Forum. I've been part of its um, annual program in Rhodes, Greece, for the last two years. I have been roped into its uh, coordinating committee and I try to play a modest role in uh, fostering dialogue through the World Public Forum. The World Public Forum is one of the most significant platforms that we have today for fostering better relations amongst civilizations, religious communities, cultural communities right across the globe. I regard it as a significant platform because it brings together people from different backgrounds, religious affiliations, cultural affiliations, and it attempts to look at some of the central challenges that confront us. Problems related to global hegemony, problems connected with the global economy, with um, issues in global politics. The World Public Forum focuses upon uh, cultural issues of uh, tremendous import. And it also attempts to look at uh, issues related to environment and to science. These are some of the fundamental challenges facing humankind today. One, what are the barriers? There are a number of barriers. I think one of the most important barriers would be related to the lack of information, knowledge and understanding of one another which has been with us for a very, very long while. Different cultures and different religions, they have coexisted in different settings, but the level of knowledge and understanding of one another, let alone empathy and positive feelings of um, love and understanding, now that has always been at uh, a minimal level in most civilizations. Uh, right across the ages. It is in a sense understandable because people had lived for a very long while within their own silos. Things are beginning to change now especially with globalization with all the changes that have taken place in technology in economics and so on and so forth. But nonetheless uh, there is uh, a low level of understanding of one another. Sometimes uh, ignorance, which in itself is not a problem, leads to prejudices. And you have people who believe in um, stereotypes, in um, half-truths, in distorted images of the other. So the way in which we image the other is a critical challenge. And that, I think, is one of our barriers. But that in itself, distorted images and uh, the way in which one perceives the other would not be a major challenge. It had not been for the way in which political groups manipulate mass sentiments. That to my mind is a second and a far more formidable challenge. The conscious, deliberate manipulation of ethnic and religious sentiments by elites in power, by elites aspiring to achieve power. And this again is something which is not new, it is ancient. It has been with us uh, for
for a very long time, except that in contemporary societies, largely because of uh, the way in which the tools of communication have made it so much easier to manipulate mass sentiments, the challenge has become all the greater. This I would regard as uh, yet another major challenge. And a third challenge, which is directly connected with um, globalization. We are also witnessing at the global level the manipulation of uh, religious and ethnic sentiments. Again, for the purposes of power, to perpetuate power, to ensure that one's own interests dominate. And this is done by some very powerful elites from some very powerful capitals of the world. And you will find that in the last few years, if you look at uh, what has happened, in very concrete terms, the US-led invasion of Afghanistan, the US-led invasion of uh, Iraq, what has happened in the Pakistan-Afghan border, what had happened in Libya, what's happening in Syria, what's happened in Sudan, in Somalia, in various parts of the world, they have contributed, without any doubt at all, to a deterioration in relations between religions and cultures, but especially between the Muslim world and the West. And if you talk about the relations between civilizations today, I think at the crux and the core of uh, this matrix is the relationship between the Muslim world and the West. And uh, developments in the last uh, few years, especially after 9-11, have, I think, um, led to a definite decline in relations between the Muslim world and the West. And this is what we have to be concerned about. Now, as a result of uh, what the centers of power in the West have done, especially Washington, the conquest of Muslim lands, dominance, the usurpation of their resources, and so on and so forth, you find that uh, some fringe groups within the Muslim world have also reacted to this. And their reaction has, in a sense, led to a further deterioration in relations between the West and the Muslim world. Why do I say this? Because many of them have chosen to resort to violence in order to express their anger and frustration at what has been happening. So violence and terrorism have also contributed to the situation that confronts us as a reaction to the violence of the powerful. Now, what has also happened in the midst of all this is you find that um, both sides stereotype one another. In the West, Islamophobia is quite widespread. And within the Muslim world, I think there is also quite a bit of stereotyping of the centers of power in the West. And uh, this doesn't um, contribute to the type of uh, harmonious inter-civilizational ties that we're all attempting to bring about. So I see these as the formidable barriers that confront us. Now, how would one try to resolve this? If you took the first of the challenges, I think one has to increase the level of knowledge and understanding of one another. Schools, universities, the media, religious and cultural institutions, all of these and many other channels can play their role in increasing knowledge and understanding of one another. I know it has been done at various points in history, but it has never really become something major for any nation on earth, where one really looks at this as a, a fundamental challenge. In other words, getting people to know and empathize with one another on a massive scale. Number two, I think what we should also do is to confront elites within nation state settings who manipulate ethnic and religious sentiments for political purposes, for purposes of power. And we can confront them within the confines of uh, whatever political system exists. In other words, you challenge them politically, you mobilize public opinion, you do all those things in order to show people that this sort of approach to politics is unacceptable. When the masses reject this type of um, 
ethnic politics, politics related to religion and culture for very narrow and selfish purposes. Elites who resort to that type of politics will realize after a while that they have no constituency. So I think that has to happen within nation states. Now, at the global level, this is perhaps a far more difficult challenge because you don't have the nation state type of setting at the global level. So uh, the way to mobilize and the forces that you have to confront, it becomes much more problematic. But nonetheless, it has to be done. I think it is so important for us to expose the workings of uh, the hegemon and what the real motives are and what the hegemon is trying to achieve, why the hegemon divides people in order to perpetuate its power. You just look at one example that I alluded to a while ago, if you look at Iraq, for instance, you find that the hegemon had an interest in playing one sectarian group against the other. And after a while, it played the other sectarian group against the one that it was backing at a certain point. And this has gone on in different settings. When I look at my own region, Southeast Asia, I find that there is also the hidden hand of uh, the global hegemon in uh, some of the conflicts which are taking place in countries like Myanmar and Sri Lanka, you find that there are also agendas of the sort. So we have to expose what is happening. That's part of our work as NGO, civil society groups, and so on. But more than that, I think there are developments which are taking place at the global level, which may not have anything to do with dialogue as such, that are leading to a different type of scenario. What do I mean by this? I think the hegemon is no longer as powerful as it was. And that has a lot to do with uh, the configuration of global power. The rise of China as an economic power, the resurgence of Russia as a political and military power, and if you look at uh, the emergence of uh, new centers of power, whether it is uh, India or Brazil, or perhaps even South Africa, in a certain context, if you look at all these changes that are taking place, and I would add Iran and Turkey and South Korea, they're going to make a very big difference in the long run. The emergence of new centers of power mean that the unipolar world is coming to an end. We are seeing the beginnings of a multipolar world, which means that dialogue among civilizations, cultures and religions will be more meaningful and equitable in a sense, because you don't have one dominant center which perpetuates discourse in its own interests that is going to change, and it's beginning to change. We can see it all around us. So that, I think, is a very positive development. We have to encourage the process. Civil society groups, the media should play their role in trying to encourage this process, the change that is taking place. Now, at the same time, I think it is important for us to show humankind that there are hopeful signs around. That decline is taking place, yes, that is a hopeful sign. There are people who are opposing hegemony, that's a hopeful sign. But what is equally hopeful is, I think, a greater understanding amongst people today that they have a lot in common with one another. In spite of all the differences in religion and culture, that there are similarities, there are affinities. When you look at how the different cultures and religions look at the environment, how they look at the use of resources, how they look at the family, how they look at politics, the economy. We are talking of values and principles embodied in all our cultures. There are tremendous similarities which have not been emphasized enough. So people are becoming aware of this. And these, I think, are some of the hopeful signs on the horizon. For that reason, I'm one of those persons who remains optimistic about the future. It's going to take a long while. But all the great changes that have taken place at the civilizational level have taken a long while. And we are, I think, perhaps at the beginning of a major transformation that we will witness over the next few centuries.